Okay, so we'll get started. Thank you everyone for joining us. So um, as you know, this is the first session in our psych crash course and Dr. Aaron Patel is kicking us off for today's session. This is um, three part crash course. So we've got today and then the next two Sundays, same time, five to 6.30. So please make sure you're keeping up on our socials and we'll be sending out newsletters and emails with the links as well. So um, please keep an eye out for that. But um, yeah, now I'll pass on to Dr. Patel. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Chavani. So hi, everyone. My name's Aaron. So I'm an academic foundation doctor in Coventry, and I'm also an honorary research fellow at Warwick Medical School. Uh, so some of you who tuned into the endo crash course would have were probably a bit more familiar with me. But I've also done a, um, a psychiatry job as my first job, so I spent four months in uh, dementia with dementia in patients and psychosis outpatients. So that's the main focus of my talk today to try and convey to you what I learned over those four months. I'm also going to start off as well by giving you an overview of the legal frameworks in psychiatry because they are important, not only for your written exams because they do come up quite a lot, but also when you're working, you'll be surprised the number of people you're asked to perform mental capacity assessments on. And at the end, we'll touch a bit on ponatal psychiatry as well. So we'll just start off with an SBA. Uh, so a 28-year-old female seen shouting and being aggressive towards her part, towards passerbys in the street. She's very stressed and paranoid that everyone's plotting against her behind the masks that they're wearing. So what is the most appropriate section of mental health act to use in this case? So I'll give you about a, uh, so about a minute. Okay, I'll give 10 more seconds. Okay, we'll stop there. And most of you have said E is your answer. The so section 136, and that is they get the correct answer. So the reason that is, is because so she's in a public place. So section 136 is all about giving the police power to detain people in a public place who they deem to be having an episode that's related to an underlying mental illness. And this section allows them to convey them to a place of safety, whether that be in a hospital or local police station or designated 136 spaces where they can then be assessed by a mental health professional. Um, I'll talk about the other sections a bit later on in the talk and about when they would be used. Okay. And just a second question. So a 20 year old female seen shouting being very aggressive towards passersby, so similar scenario to last time. Uh, so this is now, she's been taken to the 136 suite and she's assessed by two psychiatrists and she is unknown to service previously and they determined that she needs an inpatient admission. So which section of the mental health act is most appropriate in this case? Okay, again, so I'll give you probably just around a minute. Okay, so 10 more seconds. Okay, let's stop before that. So most of you have put the correct answer, which is B. So section two of the Mental Health Act. So, so she's unknown to services 
So that means that if she is admitted under the mental health act, she needs both assessment and treatment. And section two allows that to happen. So section two is a specific section for inpatient uh, investigation and management for a mental health disorder. And the patient can be held in that section for up to 28 days. Okay. And as I said, I'll talk about the other sections now. So legal frameworks. So the main frame, so there's two main acts that you need to be aware of when it comes to psychiatry. The first of those is the Mental Health Act. So it was originally from 1983, but it was updated in 2007. And this can be used in any setting where the patient has failed voluntary admission, so they don't want to be admitted to hospital, and they have a mental health disorder, and they need to either have assessment and treatment of it as an inpatient because it's quite severe, or they need to be admitted in order to protect themselves from others. So going over the main sections, so section two, as I already said, is the admission for assessment and then treatment of a mental health disorder, and it allows them to be held for up to 28 days. And for this section to be carried out, you need an approved mental health professional and two doctors, one of whom is section 12 approved. So usually that is a senior registrar or psychi psychi psychiatric consultant. So, the mental, so these acts are mainly specific to England. I'm not sure about the specific rules in Scotland, um, but these are the rules that are definitely in place for England. Okay, and section three of the Mental Health Act um, allows for admission um, is for admission for treatment of a mental health disorder. So usually this is a longer term measure, so up to six months, and similar to section two requires a approved mental health professional and two doctors to um, assess the patient to be put under the section. So, and the key thing is that section three can happen after section two. So if a patient's been an inpatient for up to 28 days and they still need further treatment, then they can be converted from a section two to a section three. A section three can also be used in cases where a patient is already known to services. So if we go back to the SPA we talked about earlier where there was a patient who was um, being assessed, because she was unknown to services and she hadn't been already investigated and assessed, section two was appropriate. However, if she'd already been an inpatient before, um, it, sometimes it can be appropriate just to go straight for a section three if the underlying diagnosis is already known. Okay. So section four is for emergency treatment. So this is where someone needs treatment sooner than would be able to get a mental health assessment done. So this is valid for up to 72 hours. And usually this only requires one doctor and an um, a, um, approved mental health professional. And they must be seen by another doctor, usually by the on-call psychiatrist within 72 hours. And this is to determine whether they need further admission under section two or section three or whether they're suitable for either voluntary admission or discharge if they don't need to be an inpatient any longer. Okay. So now we come on to the sections that you will probably come into more contact with if you are working in the general hospital. So section 5.2 is for detaining a patient who's already been in hospital. So they, um, so this is where you think that a patient may have an underlying mental health disorder, but um, does not want to stay within hospital for it to be treated. And any doctor with full GMC registration can complete the section. So anyone above F1. And this gives you 72 hours to then get the patient formally assessed. An important thing to mention is that section 5.2 can only be applied if a patient has a hospital bed. So patients in ED um, do not have an inpatient ward bed, so cannot be detained under this section. Okay, that's something important to note. So then section 5.4 is equivalent to a 5.2, but this is for nurses. 
So, and this is a shorter time frame, so six hours. So a nurse, if they think that there's a patient who has a mental health disorder, but, this, but wants to get uh, discharged against themselves, again, um, against um, advice, they can be detained by the nurses for up to six hours. And then this gives enough time for either a doctor to apply for a 5-2 or for them to have a formal um, Mental Health Act assessment. So with, so someone's asked, with the 5-2, does me uh, medical admissions unit count? So this will depend on the hospital. So some, so usually most cases, the medical assessment unit or admissions unit is an inpatient unit with, and the patient would be counted as an inpatient if they are on the medical admissions ward. The a 5-2 can be used in most cases. Okay. So how long does an assessment take to do? So mental health act assessments usually, um, so it varies depending on what condition the patient has and also how compliant the patient is with the assessment. Sometimes it can take a few hours. Um, so it's, um, sometimes it can take almost half a day depending on, as I said, the severity of the patient. So there isn't a designated time frame. It's more that there's just a list of questions in the, that the um, assessors have to go through. And once they've reached the end of that, they can then decide where how to proceed. Okay, and finally, some, the last two sections. So section 135 and section 136. And these are sections that are relate that relate to the police. So sec well, so section 135 allows the police access to someone's private premises for either them to be moved to a place of safety or for a mental health 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 act assessment to be done within the person's own house. So you need a magistrate's court warrant for this to be done and the police must be accompanied by either a doctor or an uh, approved mental health professional when they are um, forcing entry into someone's premises under the uh, section 135. And lastly, section 136, so this relates to the SBA from earlier, so as I said before, allows the police to detain a person in a public place. So not so as I said, not someone's private premises like 135, it has to be a public place. And um, take them to a place of safety if they think that they're suffering from mental health disorder. And this section act, uh, lasts for up to 72 hours. And as I said before, during this time, they should be assessed by a doctor or, or, and an allied mental health professional to determine what happens next for um, following a formal Mental Health Act assessment. So that's the Mental Health Act. And second, so, um, so Section 135 doesn't have a specific time defined time frame. So Section 135 is, in Section 135, the important thing is you're not detaining anyone. All you're doing is getting a warrant from magistrate's court that would allow you to force entry into someone's premises. So, so someone's just asked about the first SBA. So, so there wasn't a mention of the police in the question, but the point is that the patient was having an acute mental health crisis in a public place, and they were potentially a threat to passers-by because they were being actively aggressive towards people around them. This means that they would have to be detained and moved to a place of safety, and the police would typically be involved in this if it's in a public place. Okay, um, so moving on to Mental Health, Mental Capacity Act. So this is something that, as an F1 that you're working on the ward, you'll be very familiar with because there are quite a few patients you encounter who do are deemed to lack capacity in some sense. So there's important principles that need to apply. I've listed them here as they're stated in the Mental Capacity Act, but just to summarize, the main things are that you must deem all patients to have capacity unless proved otherwise. And when you're trying to help pers a person make a decision who you think may be lacking capacity, you have to take all steps practical to allow them to make that decision. So for example, if someone has um, hear a hearing impairment using visual aids to help them communicate the information. A person, um, so, and important thing to remember that just because a person makes an unwise decision doesn't mean that they lack capacity. 
they may just be making an unwise decision on their own behalf. And if you feel that they do lack, do have capacity to make that decision, you shouldn't be using the Mental Capacity Act to reverse their decision in any way. And a final thing to remember is when you are using the Mental Capacity Act to make a decision for someone, as, is, as always is the case, making sure that that decision is the least restrictive for the patient and also in their best interests. So when you're assessing someone's capacity, there's four main things you need to determine. First thing is, do they understand the information? Can they, secondly, can they weigh up the information? Thirdly, can they retain that information? Can they retain the information? And fourthly, can they communicate their, their decision to you? And if they're lacking in at least one of those, then they can be deemed to have, um, to not have capacity. But remember, capacity is decision specific, so patients may lack capacity for complex decisions, but may retain capacity for more simple decisions. So every decision has to have an individual capacity assessment. And one last thing is DOLGS, so Deprivation of Liberty Safeguards, something that a lot of people aren't too familiar with. But this was established with the Mental Capacity Act in 2005. And this is a series of checks that are in place ensure that when a person is deprived of their liberty that it's in their best interests and it's most appropriate for them. So usually most cases you'll see this are patients with dementia who don't understand why they need care and they don't understand that they need to be in care homes or in hospitals. So you apply for adults so that you can keep them within their care home or within their, their hospital setting and the dolls checks make sure that the restrictions you're putting in place are appropriate for that person. Okay, so that's dolls in a nutshell. Okay, so that's the legal frameworks, the, the important ones that you need to know for your exams. So now we'll move on. So another SBA, so 75 year old woman comes to her GP uh, with her husband and reports that, her, that um, memories have been getting worse over several months and forgetting names and faces. Um, he explains that she seems some more lucid at times, but on occasion she's very forgetful and confused. Um, her husband also says that she's distressed by some, um, that he becomes distressed by her sometimes because she says there's sometimes people sat in the living room that uh, when they're not actually there. So over the past few months, um, she's also developed a tremor in her right hand. So what's the most likely diagnosis? Okay, 10 more seconds. Okay, let's stop the poll there. Uh, most of you have said C, which is the correct answer. So this patient has uh, Louis body dementia. Yes. So what are the from the questions? So, so she's got an evidence of dementia. So she's had deteriorating memory. So that doesn't really rule out anything. But the clues come that um, the fact that the memory appears to be fluctuating. So Lewy body dementia typically has a fluctuating course of uh, cognitive impairment. And it's also associated with visual hallucinations as she also developed. So then you're left really with Lewy body dementia and Parkinson's disease dementia because of the tremor. But the way you can differentiate that is usually with Lewy body dementia, the Parkinsonian features come second after the memory problems, whereas Parkinson's disease dementia is the other way around. So that's how you distinguish those two, okay? And someone just asked about um, doles and covertly giving medication. So yes, that's another example where doles would be used because you're depriving the person of their liberty, their ability to choose what medications they have. And um, 
So for, um, problem with dolls, um, so with covertly giving medications, that there is quite a lot of checks that go into it. And this, Okay, so next single best answer. So 78 year old man is visited at his home by GP as he did not attend his diabetes appointment. He is orientated to place but not time and the GP forms a mocker and he scores 14 out of 30. He says he's been feeling very well recently and does not need his medications. So uh, what option would be your initial management? Okay, um, and let's stop there. So most of you have put the answer A, admission possible for observation. So that's not the correct answer. So he he appears to be living okay at home. I mean, he's not, he's orientated to place, not time. He's got memory impairment, but that's not a need to admit him to hospital at this time. He's not physically being a danger to, from what you can see in this question, he's not a danger to himself or anyone around him at this time. So he doesn't even need patient admission. Um, at the same time, he's not got very severe cognitive impairment, but he's still orientated to place. And he's still aware of the medications he should be taking. So he doesn't need a, a cognitive enhancement drug such as, a cognitive enhancement drug such as denepezil at this stage. And also, starting denephazil will not be a decision made by a GP. It would be one that is made by a specialist uh, dementia practitioner. Um, there's no evidence that this patient has depression, so surgery is not the answer. And he's not got any extreme agitation or psychotic symptoms, so he doesn't need a lansipine. And one thing that people often forget is that dementia, regardless of the type, but particularly Alzheimer's and vascular dementia, have an um, increased association with cardiovascular disease, such as, cardiovas um, such as MIs and strokes. And this patient already seems to have pre-existing cardiovascular disease. He has existing diabetes. So an important thing is you need to minimize his cardiovascular risk factors going forward. Okay. So someone to say, it doesn't say what type of diabetes could have a hypo, um, he could have a hypo, yes, but um, I just consider the question for a moment. If the if it's not one of the stems, then it's not one of the answers. But yeah, he could be having a hypo in this case, definitely. If that was an option, then I'm sure that the stem would give you a bit more information that was leading towards that direction. And so dementias, so. Most dementia, so particularly Alzheimer's, has an increased risk of cardiovascular events, and so does, um, and obviously vascular dementia as well, by its nature of development. And, okay. And just to go, someone's, um, so let's move on. And another SBA, so 76 year old woman with a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. Um, has admitted to hospital after she's been found lying on the floor of her bedroom. Uh, in hospital, she's talking incoherently and displaying disorganized thoughts. Her uh, medications for hospitalization includes a benzodiazepine, which has been started recently for insomnia. So what's the most likely diagnosis here?
Okay, and let's stop the polling. So the most you have for B, which is the correct answer. So this woman most likely has benzotoxicity, which is the reason for her becoming drowsy and losing consciousness at that time. And that is most evident from the information you're given in the stem. Okay. Um, progression of, so delirium secondary UTI, something to consider as well, but not most likely given the information you have. But if you do have a patient who is delirious in general, it's always worthwhile doing a urine dip because um, UTIs are a reasonably common cause of delirium, especially in the elderly. Um, with progression of the Alzheimer's dementia, um, important thing is that Alzheimer's disease is very chronic and slow progressing. Um, if there's a sudden sudden deterioration in their state, then there's often an underlying cause, whether that be um, a vascular event or whether that be um, acute delirium on top of their dementia. And there's no evidence this patient having depression from this stem. So pseudo-dementia is not likely to be the diagnosis here. Okay, so now we're going to move on to talking about uh, cognitive disorders. Okay, so main cognitive disorder that you need to be aware of is dementia, quite an all-encompassing term. So it's a syndrome of progressive and global intellectual deterioration. But an important thing to note is that there's no impairment of consciousness with their intellectual deterioration. Okay. So the causes of dementia are very varied. Um, so the way I like to classify my causes of dementia are those that are non-reversible and those that are reversible to some extent. Okay, so your non-reversible ones are usually your more classical dementias, so Alzheimer's, uh, vascular, Lewy body, frontotemporal, Parkinson's and Huntington's, and prion disease is a, um, a bit aside, is extremely rare. Um, the reversible ones are the ones that you try and rule out with your initial investigations when a patient comes in with a query dementia diagnosis. So your metabolic causes such as uh, uremia, vitamin deficiency, B12 folate, and thiamine deficiency so are all common causes of um, cognitive impairment, as is alcohol toxicity. Um, if patients had repeated um, head trauma or some very severe head trauma, that can be a cause of dementia developing. You also need to consider any intracranial reasons for um, deterioration in cognition. So things such as um, hydrocephalus, subdural hematomas, or tumors developing. Particularly normal pressure hydrocephalus in the elderly is a cause of dementia. Some infections can present in many ways with dementia, such as HIV and syphilis. Inflammatory disorders such as vasculitis and SLE could lead to dementia as well. And um, endocrinology pathologies can also be a cause of dementia, most commonly hypothyroid and hypoparathyroid. And one aside at the end is depression. So depression, depression can present as a pseudo dementia, so it's not a true dementia. And usually their cognitive impairment is secondary to their low mood. Okay, so those are the main causes that you should consider when you have a patient with a potential dementia diagnosis. So just going through each, each of the main types. So Alzheimer's disease. So key characteristics are insidious onset and gradual decline in cognitive state. And when you're thinking about the pathology of Alzheimer's disease, usually it's global um, atrophy of the cerebral cortex. And classically, you have these amyloid plaques, which are the positive and these neurofibrillary tangles. So you, these are otherwise known as tau bodies, um, which you may see on SBA questions when um, especially in pathology exams. So Alzheimer's disease is by far the most common cause of dementia, about 50% of cases are down to it. And this factors, um, as expected, age, family history. As I said before, it, there is an association between Alzheimer's disease and cardiovascular risk. So that's why it is important to manage those cardiovascular risk factors to prevent, um, to limit further deterioration. Um, other causes are repeated head injuries and also Down syndrome has an association. 
And when you're thinking about what can distinguish Alzheimer's from other causes of cognitive impairment and dementia, um, one way that I was taught to remember is the four A's of Alzheimer's. So amnesia, aphasia, agnosia, and apraxia. So if they have these um, these four features or combination of these features, it's more likely leaning towards the diagnosis of Alzheimer's uh, rather than the other types of dementias. Okay. So now vascular dementia, which is the second most common cause of dementia. And this is um, cognitive impairment secondary to any cause of cerebrovascular disease, whether this be in large vessels through strokes, or whether this be smaller uh, vessel disease, such as vasculitis. Okay. And this somet sometimes can be the manifestation of unrecognized strokes, especially if they're small strokes. So as you can imagine, the risk factors for vascular dementia are exactly the same as risk factors for stroke or any other cardiovascular disease, so hypertension, smoking, um, high cholesterol, etc. And how you distinguish this from other causes of dementia from history is cognitive impairment is often patchy. So as I said, so if you think back to what we have with the Alzheimer's, you typically have all the four A's and they use, most of them are usually present. However, if you have cognitive impairment mainly focused in just one domain, then vascular dementia should be high up on your differentials because the symptoms are reflecting where the vascular event has happened within the brain. And another thing to remember is they often have a classically stepwise progression. So they, there's usually a period of stability followed by a sudden deterioration in their cognitive state and then again, plateaus off with some more stability. And these usually represent each infarct happening within the brain. And when you're looking at the patients and examining them, looking for any signs of focal neurology that could point to there being probably a previous vascular event before. So thirdly, so most common, third most common cause, Lewy body dementia, um, which, you, uh, which was displayed in the SPA from earlier. So pathology wise, as it says the name, Lewy bodies are found within the cortex, mainly localized within the brainstem. And these are include uh, protein inclusions, inclusions. So the main features that will alert you to this being Lewy body dementia are the visual hallucinations, um, their fluctuating level of alertness and cognition, as I said before, and the, the development of new Parkinsonian signs, signs. And as I said before, they're usually more mild than they would be in full blown Parkinson's disease. And they usually happen either around the same time or after the development of cognitive impairment. And other features are very similar to Parkinson's disease, so falls, um, uh, autonomic features such as bladder, urinary, um, bladder dysfunction, sensitivity to neuroleptics. Okay, so your drugs that you typically use in um, for antipsychotics, so your dopamine antagonists, can exacerbate the condition further. Okay. So now frontal temporal dementia. So we're getting onto dementias which are less common now, about five percent of cases, and similar pathology to Alzheimer's, but your um, but your atrophy is localized to front, the frontal and temporal lobes of the brain. And sorry, someone just asked about what I said before about dopamine antagonists. So because the pathology of Lewy body dementia is very similar to Parkinson's disease. Um, Remember that in Parkinson's disease, you get atrophy of, and you get loss of the dopaminergic neurons. So if you give someone with these features a dopamine antagonist, you're going to worsen the Parkinsonian features. So back to frontal temporal dementia. So, and the pathology finding is these, um, in the subtype of Pick's disease is these tau protein collections. So how they present is exactly 
what you'd what, what you would expect. So they have deterioration of frontal lobe function and temporal lobe function. So if you remember back to what frontal lobe function is, it is executive functions mostly. So your judgment, your how you behave, your personality, and um, and your ability to for motivation. So these are all lacking in a patient with frontal lobe atrophy. And if they've got a more temporal lobe presentation, they often have deterioration of speech. And when you think about what's in the temporal lobe in terms of speech, so temporal lobe is where your Wernicke's area is. So you often have difficulty with comprehension of speech. So um, as they said, they have fluid and they present with fluent, fluent meaningless speech. And usually they present with primarily frontal or temporal presentation, but as it progresses, they eventually develop both. Okay. So they're the main types of dementias that you need to know for your exams. So how do you assess the patient with dementia? So take a full history of what they were, what they are able to do currently, what they were able to do before. It's important to see what their baseline level of functioning was and what it is currently. And it's important to take a collateral history from friends and relatives. If in your OSCEs or PACEs you do have a case where there's a dementia patient, always say that you want to take a collateral history. And this is true for most like, um, psychiatric patients because you need that collateral because a lot of psychiatric patients do not have insight to give you a true idea of what's been going on with them. You do a full physical examination because you want to see whether there's any signs of organic pathology, such as any vascular events. So you're looking for any focal neurology. You do a formal cognitive function test. There's all sorts of ones available. So the one that I had in the SPA4 is the MOCA. Other ones include um, the ACE and the mini mental state examination. And something you can't, um, these function tests do take some time. They can take up to half an hour. So if you want to do a quick screening test and the AMTS is something you can do, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with. And finally, you then do your full mental state examination as you would with any psychiatric presentation. So investigations for dementia, as I said before, you're just, you're trying to rule out all any organic cause behind their dementia that could potentially be reversible. So this is mainly through blood tests, as you can see here, so your full blood count, your electrolytes, inflammatory markers, thyroid function, B12 folate, glucose. You want to just check their urine because you do want to make sure that this isn't, um, there isn't any aspect of delirium going on. And you want to do some imaging as well. You need to do imaging before you can make a diagnosis of dementia because you want to rule out any underlying structural causes. And as I said before, Syph uh, syphilis, HIV, vasculitis can all be causes as well, though they are rarer. So if you do suspect these as causes, then you can do relevant testing for those. Okay. So dementia, how do you manage it? So with psychiatry, whenever you're approaching management for a patient psychiatry, you always have to think about your biopsychosocial model. And this is something that applies for any condition in psychiatry, not just dementia. And you will see me referring to this again and again throughout this talk. And with dementia, an important thing is get, refer get them seen by a specialist uh, memory service because only a specialist memory service can do formal assessment and diagnosis for cognitive impairment. And they will be needed to um, assign a care coordinator to liaise between various services involved in their care. And this is mainly only unlocked once you've got them formally diagnosed by a memory service. So if we go through each step, so the biological management of dementia. So this is so medically managing them. So it falls under two aspects. So firstly, how do you manage their any challenging behaviors? So um, benzodiazepines can be used in dementia patients for managing ag agitation and aggression. Antipsychotics can be used when the patient sometimes exhibits psychotic symptoms or very extreme agitation. But a side note around psychotics, 
and this is something that is quite popular in exam SPAs, is they have to be used with caution in patients with dementia, particularly in patients um, uh, with Lewy body dementia, because it can worsen Parkinsonian symptoms. And, and so they should not really be used in Lewy body dementia, but they should also be used with extreme caution in Alzheimer's, because as I said before, there is an increased cardiovascular risk in Alzheimer's patients, and studies have shown that antipsychotics do increase that risk for of, of strokes in particular. Um, hypnotics, so things like zopiclone can be used for sleep disturbance management, and if a patient has depression anxiety symptoms, you can give them antidepressants as well. And secondly, you have medications to um, delay further cognitive decline, and as I said before, these should only be started by specialists. So there's two main classes, so your, um, your cholinesterase inhibitors, so denepazil and rivastigmine are the main ones used. And these are used in moderate to severe Alzheimer's, and the aim of these is to slow the rate of cognitive decline. And memantine, which is the glutamate antagonist, can be used as a second line option if there is no response to either of these two initial options. Okay. Next, we come on to psychological management, which is by far the most important in patients with dementia. And from working in a dementia inpatient ward, I can tell you that the most important thing that we do to help dementia patients is by using behavioral techniques, identifying what triggers their underlying difficult or risky behavior, and then altering the way we interact with those patients to help them cope with that. So if a patient's become agitated, why are they becoming agitated? And can we do anything to reduce their levels of agitation? And there's lots of therapies that can be used. So usually multi-sensory approach is used. And structured conversation exercises can also help patients. And a final thing to think about is developing routines. So if you develop routines early on in dementia patients, these routines are often maintained. So this means that the patient can often cope and maintain a level of independence for a lot longer. Um, there, are, there is room for formal psychological therapies. One of these is cognitive stimulation therapy. So this is almost brain training. So you're trying to build a cognitive reserve in these patients and preserve skills. So as I said before, so that these are maintained and they can maintain a level of independence for longer. And reminiscence therapy is something that's also used. So talking, um, discussing with the patient about their own life so that they, they uh, maintain a sense of self-identity. And finally, social management. And social management has two aspects. So one is for the patient themselves, and secondly is for the carer as well because dementia is, has a great impact not only on the patient, but on their relatives and people looking after them. And it's important that they are supported as well. So social management can fall into two categories. So adapting lifestyle, so making sure that the patient is at least risk to themselves. So making sure that they're always got identification with them and people that can be contacted in case they get lost making sure they're um, reviewing their medications, make sure that they're not on too many medications or medications that are not necessary, making it easy using blister packs then to identify which medications need to be taken. Simple things like changing gastroelectricity um, so that they're not leaving gas on by accident and um, adjusting the environment itself. So making sure they have clocks on the walls and calendars, they know when and when it is and also adjusting their environment. So sometimes patients with patterns of carpets, particularly body, can, this can trigger visual hallucinations. There's something to consider there. And then support, as I said, for both the patient and the carer. So supporting them with maintaining independence and with their living, so functionally, and also socially with things like finance. And also making sure that the, um, there, there is respite care available so that relatives can also have a break. So what is a dosset? So a dosset box, yeah, is a dosset box is a calendar pack, yeah. So it's, so the, the patient can, so the medication can be um, usually split up three times, uh, three or more times a day, 
and the patient knows when to take each medication. Okay, so that's dementia in a nutshell. So I'll move on to the next common um, cognitive impairment presentation, which is delirium, also known as co uh, acute confusional state. And the key difference between dementia and delirium is the course. So dementia is typically chronic and slow progressing. Delirium is acute and fluctuating course. And they often have disturbed cognition, consciousness, attention and perception of the, of the world around them. There's two main subtypes of delirium. Hyperactive delirium, which is the one most people are more familiar with. So patients become increasingly agitated and restless. But there's also hyperactive delirium, which is much more unrecognized and it's something to be wary of. So don't only be wary of the patients who are becoming more aggressive, but also the patients who were more active but now become very quiet on the ward, as it's important to consider, do they have hyperactive delirium? The delirium has a multitude of causes. Most of them are very similar to the organic causes we want to rule out in dementia. Okay, so trauma, um, so head trauma in particular, uh, thinking about the spiritual cardiac causes, so hypoxic uh, patients and hypercapnic patients can become delirious. Infections, both intracranial and systemic infections can cause delirium. Metabolic causes broadly similar to in dementia, so liver and renal failure with uremia, electrolyte imbalances such as hyponatremia and calcium imbalance. Various drugs, so we talked about benzos earlier, but other ones include opiates and um, GAs and anticholinergics. A whole host of endocrine disorders can cause delirium. Nutritional deficiencies such as thiamine B12 and folate your intracranial CNF pathologies, such as raised intracranial pressure, intracranial tumors, can cause delirium, vascular events, such as MIs and strokes. But then at the bottom here, these three, constipation, urinary retention and pain, along with UTI are by far the most common cause of delirium that you will encounter um, working as a doctor. So always make sure in a patient with delirium, have, are their bowels opening, are there any pain? Are they retaining urine? Do they have a urine infection or any other infection? So those are the most common things you need to be rolling out in a delirium patient. So presentation of delirium can vary a lot depending on whether the patient's hyperactive or hyperactive, but main features are they have disturbance of cognition, their behavior is adjusted, so either they become very agitated or they become very withdrawn, Perception of the world around them is altered, so they may have hallucinations, more typically visual hallucinations in delirium, and they may start having delusional thoughts, such as staff plotting against them. And their off physical function is also disturbed, so sleep wake cycle is disturbed, appetite is changed, and they often either are really mobile or they're mobilizing less than they normally would. Okay. So if you have any of these things, you should be thinking about, does this patient have delirium? So how do you investigate delirium? So most important thing is review their medications. Are they on anything like a benzodiazepine or an opiate that could be responsible for this? Because then you've got an easily reversible thing. Urine, rule out infection, make sure they're actually passing urine, that they're not uh, retaining urine. Do bloods particularly looking at your electrolytes and full blood count, your inflammatory markers. And you can do thorough blood tests, depending on whether you think there's a particular underlying cause, such as B12 folate or thyroid function. Okay, you want your blood gaps, make sure there's not hypoxic or hypercapnic. An ECG is useful to make sure there's no underlying arrhythmias, you don't, don't, don't want to miss any MIs. Chest x-ray, you want to make sure there's no sign of infection there. Pneumonia is a common cause of delirium. And if you're still not, nothing obvious is flagging up at this point and or there is focal neurology, then you want to consider a head CT with a lumbar, lumbar puncture if CT is normal. So um, I was just asked about sleep disturbance in delirium. So as I said, it's very dependent on the patient. Some patients may have difficulty sleeping. Some patients may be sleeping too much, depending on whether they're hyperactive or hyperactive. Um, 
So the sleep disturbance can vary. But a more common pe picture is their actual sleep-wake cycle is disturbed. So they're often awake during the night and asleep during the day. So delirium is typically worse at night as well. Someone's just asked that. But yes, delirium is worse at night. Um, so I'm just to mention, delirium is worse at night because of the lack of light in the room. Lack of natural light can also make delirium worse. So how do we manage patients with delirium? So first thing, as I said, is appropriate lit environment. So as I said, if there's lack of natural daylight, if it's dark, they're often going to be more disorientated than they are if it's bright around them. So make sure that the environment is appropriately lit. Make sure that they're orientated to time, place, and person. Make sure that to do this, that you're addressing any sensory problem that could be impairing that. So have they got glasses that they're not wearing at the moment? Have they got hearing aids that aren't working? Try and fix these problems. Um, make sure that they're supervised, but in a supportive way, usually by people that they're familiar with. So relatives are quite good, obviously with COVID around, that's not usually um, suitable at this time. But another thing is, I've put an in inverted commas here, special nurses. So some patients relate more to or some nurses and other nurses. So try and get the nurses that they like looking after them so that they're a bit more calm. And on this note, minimize changes to them. So don't be moving them around the wards. Don't be, um, try and keep the staff members with them regularly, um, the regular staff members with them. And then once you've managed their behavior, you need to try and investigate and reverse the underlying cause at the same time. The useful acronym to think about is this pinch. So rule out pain, infection, constipation, are they well hydrated? Make sure you rule their medications and adjust them. But is there anything in the environment that's making the delirium worse? So try and, try and address all of these areas to see if you can identify what's making the delirium worse and what you can do to make it better. <clears throat> so, and medications and delirium. Ideally, these should only be used for short term and only used as a last resort if you feel that they're a threat to either themselves or to other patients and behaviour techniques are not working or a threat to staff as well, of course. So use the oral, oral route as possible. If not failing that, then IM is available. So usually two choices that we use are antipsychotics or benzodiazepines. Which one you use first is very trust dependent. So each trust will have its own guidelines about which one you go to first. But overall, the consensus is usually to use a low dose antipsychotic first, such as haloperidol. Obviously, there are contraindications to haloperidol. As I said before, Lewy body dementia, Parkinson's disease being the big two, because they will, it will make those diseases worse. Um, benzos, we usually try and use second line because in some patients they can actually worsen delirium initially in the first instance because they are a cause of delirium themselves. But they are particularly useful in cases where we can't use antipsychotics, where antipsychotics are not working, or if the patient's delirium is due to alcohol withdrawal because um, benzos such as chlordazepoxide are actually used as part of your alcohol withdrawal regimen. Okay, so now let's move on. So next SBA, so 24-year-old student admitted to an inpatient psych unit on section two. For instance, florid persecutory thoughts and auditory hallucinations about BTP plotting against her. She's assessed and it's decided to start her on medication to help settle her symptoms. Which medication should she start?
say 10 more seconds. Okay, we'll stop following there. So most you have protiapine E, which is the correct answer. Oh, there. So this patient has presented with an acute psychotic episode, acute thought disorder, and so got delusions and hallucinations. So with a patient presenting with acute psychosis, your first line treatment is a atypical or second generation antipsychotic. So the only one of these which is the one of those um, or not that. So the main one we use, the one that classes that is quetiapine. I didn't say the only one because technically clozapine is also a second generation antipsychotic, but clozapine is used in cases of uh, treatment resistant um, psychosis. And I'll talk about that a bit later on. Bloxetine and antidepressants so are not be used here. Haloperidol is a first generation or, eight, or typical antipsychotic. So this is an option to, that can be used usually as second line. And lorazepam is, um, so benzodiazepine, can, can be used in certain cases the patient's extremely agitated, but not routinely used in say, treatment of psychosis. So next SBA, 26-year-old man presented a medic, monthly medical review at the early intervention clinic. Complains that has recently had painful spasms of the neck. Last month, he was started on haloperidol dip depot to control symptoms. So what is the most med appropriate medication to start in this case? Okay, 10 more seconds. Okay, so yeah, most of you have put the correct answer, which is C for cyclidine. So this patient, so he's been starting antipsychotic and very soon after starting it has developed painful spasms of the neck. So this is um, referred to as torticodus. And so this is um, a manifestation of acute dystonia, which is a recognized extrapyramidal side effect of, of typi typically um, first generation or typical antipsychotics like haloperidol. And treatment for this, besides adjusting the antipsychotic itself, is giving uh, procyclidine is the, is the first line management for this. Okay. So the other medications, so dantrolene is used in neuroleptic malignant syndrome. I'll talk about that a bit later. Lazepam has no role in um, acute dystonia. Propanolol can be used as management for acophasia um, as another extra brandal side effect. And tetrabenazine is a potential treatment option for um, tardive dyskinesia. Okay, so we'll move on now to talk about psychotic disorders. So what is psychosis? So psychosis is a mental disorder which causes a person to be perceive, believe, or interpret things differently. And typically they will present with all of the first rank symptoms of psychosis. So these are delusions. Delusions being beliefs that are false, um, persevered, so quite fixed and irrational. And they're firmly held by the person despite rational evidence um, to contradict those beliefs. And it cannot be explained by the person's background, so their religious viewpoint or cultural viewpoints. Hallucinations, so disruption of sensory perception, where they have where they perceive something without appropriate stimulation uh, stimulation. And in psychosis, this is typically auditory. Uh, pass passivity, 
So this is where the feeling that thoughts, feelings and actions are controlled by an external, external being or external force. And finally, thought disorder. So either your thoughts are withdrawn, so they're been taken out of your mind, someone is putting thoughts within your mind, or thought broadcasting where your thoughts are available for others around you to see. Okay, so those are the first rank symptoms of psychosis. So common delusional themes that are often encountered in patients with psychosis are erotomanic, so belief that someone's in love with them, grandiose, so believing that, um, so inflated sense of self, jealousy, so typically believing that their partner's cheating on them, persecutory, so believing that people are out to get them or they're being badly treated, uh, somatic delusions, so that they have an underlying medical condition, which they don't, and ideas of reference, and that so that they have um, special uh, that so certain things have special significance. So, for example, their it raining today means that they're going to going to win the lottery. So, ideas those ideas of reference, they see one thing and they take it to mean something completely different. And now I'm just going to talk about some specific psychotic syndromes, just because these often come up in SPA questions um, where you have to identify what the underlying syndrome is. So Charles Bonnet is where they get visual hallucinations, which are due to visual impairment, not an underlying psychotic disorder. Ek bombs, quite typical in um, cocaine use, or organic psychotic disorders, where they have a belief that they have bugs crawling on them. So cocaine bugs is typically um, another word for it. A fellow syndrome. So again, this idea of delusional jealousy that their partner's being unfaithful. Capgrass syndrome is the belief that the people around them, like close relatives, have been replaced by someone else who looks exactly like them. Uh, the Clarence Bolt syndrome, which is the belief that um, someone is in love with them, usually someone famous. And folie à deux is where Someone, um, so someone with psychotic symptoms um, makes a, relevant, a relative or person around them actually believe or go along with their psychotic symptoms. Okay, so those are the main psychotic symptoms to be aware of, uh, syndromes to be aware of and to be able to recognize. So cause of psychosis, so you can have psychosis symptoms in affective disorders like depression. So usually at the severe end of depression and bipolar. You can have transient psychotic disorders either due to medications, so steroids, particularly um, common cause, or substance misuse such as alcohol, withdrawal, alcohol toxicity or drugs such as cannabis or cocaine. Psychosis can be second to a whole host of medical disorders such as intracranial infections, trauma, uh, um, brain trauma, tumors, strokes, vasculitis, or Cushing's, schizophrenia um, disorders, which are light disorders, which are non-affective. So things like delirium, as I said before, and delusional disorders, peripheral psychosis, so this is psychosis that develops postpartum, and schizophrenia, of which I'll talk about in a bit. So schizophrenia is essentially a chronic relapsing condition characterized by psychosis, which has lasted for at least one month. And this usually happens in three phases or three main group symptoms. So you have your at-risk mental state. So this is where they have low-grade psychotic symptoms, such as low, um, so, such as withdrawal from society and lack of interest in their life, so work and relationships but they don't usually have the frank psychotic symptoms that we usually associate with your first rank symptoms. So these at-risk mental state patients are, as, it, as the name goes, at risk of then subsequently developing full-blown psychosis. And in the acute phase, this usually manifests with your positive symptoms. And these are the first rank symptoms that I talked about before. And usually after these have manifested, there is a period of burnout usually. Where this patient then primarily exhibits negative symptoms and these 
can usually pers uh, um, persist despite ongoing treatment. So these are things like um, blunted affect, apathy, loss of drive or um, anhedonia, withdrawal from society, cognitive impairment, poverty of thought or poverty of speech, and then catatonic behaviour. Uh, so catatonic behaviour um, is a is a constellation of symptoms, um, usually this, um, defined by this a number of these negative symptoms like um, being socially withdrawn and they have this characteristic feature called waxy flexibility where if you were to take the patient's arm and move it up and you let go they would keep it in that position okay so um subtypes of schizophrenia main subtypes are paranoid the most common so they have these Obviously, paranoid delusions, hallucinations, hebephrenic, more common um, in 15, 25 year olds. And this often has a fluctua fluctuating mood along with these delusions and hallucinations. Catatonic, as I talked about before, your catatonic features are these prominent negative symptoms along with this wa uh, wave or waxy flexibility, stupor, so uh, poverty of basically poverty of movement and posturing so they have abnormal keep their body in abnormal positions and then you have residual sim and simple types which are mainly just negative symptoms okay so the etiology of schizophrenia can be divided into biopsychosocial as with most things in psychiatry so biologically there's a strong so there's a strong genetic component with family history and there's actually an obstetric component as well so a lot of um so most a lot of studies have shown that patients who go on to develop schizophrenia actually did have complications during either their mother's pregnancy or during their birth so low, low birth weight preeclampsia they were born premature for example and the relation to this um so the um, so um, and these support to be related to um, cognitive and neurodevelopment and the way these develop and there's obviously substance abuse as well can cause it psychologically. So if they have a pre morbid personality disorder, things like schizotypal personality, or if they have um, adverse life events earlier on in their life. And also their social circumstances, so particularly people with low economic status and, and immigrants, they are more prone to person schizophrenia, especially if they're isolated. Okay. So schizoaffective disorder, uh, similar etiology to schizophrenia, except they have both symptoms of schizophrenia and mood disorder at the exact at the same time or similar time at the same intensity. Okay. And so they need to have these uh, um, these symptoms overlapping, essentially, to have a diagnosis of schizoaffective. Okay. So delusional disorder, I'll just touch on very briefly. So this is essentially where you get the delusions, but you don't get any of the other psychotic symptoms, and you don't get any auditory visual hallucinations. So you may still get some tactile or olfactory hallucinations. And often these patients don't have as much impairment of their psychosocial functioning. So often able to still clear, think clearly and their behavior, though it might be disturbed, is usually consistent with the delusions they're experiencing. Okay. And their delusions cannot be explained by substance misuse, by delirium or any other mood disorder. Okay. Okay. So psychosis management. Um, so I said split again into your biopsychosocial approach. And you so psychosis, you need to get early specialist management. So this will depend on how severe the patient is. If you so you need to do your risk assessment, as you would for any psychiatric patient. If you deem them to be high risk of harm to themselves, to others, or you think they may be at high risk from others around them. Then they do need an inpatient admission in a specialist psychiatric unit. 
if you don't think this is the case, then they can be managed in outpatient and they'll be seen usually by the early intervention psychosis service, uh, so dedicated team for managing uh, um, so early psychosis presentations. And usually they can be followed up as an outpatient if they were previously an inpatient by the crisis team. So biological management of psychosis. So your first line managed, as I said before, is your atypical antipsychotics. So things like spirodona, lanzapine, cotypine. Your second line management is either a first, another second, another atypical antipsychotic, or you can use a typical first generation one. So things like haloperidol. The third line is your treatment resistant psychosis. This is where the patient symptoms have not responded after you've tried a, a six week course of two different antipsychotics. And then when you have this, you can either try clozapine, but if clozapine is contraindicated or if they're not, if they refuse clozapine, then you can try combination and psychotic therapy. Okay. So your antipsychotic options. So just to run through, so you either have your tablets or you can have monthly IM depo injections if there's a preference for those or they're non-compliant. And you have to titrate up the dose to the minimum required to control symptoms. So your first generation antipsychotics are purely dopamine antagonists, and these are more associated with your extra and hyperprolactinemia. Okay, your second generation antipsychotics are antagonists for dopamine receptors and also serotonin receptors. So they have a lower risk of extra abdominal side effects, but a higher risk of metabolic side effects. So weight gain, dyslipidemia, and hyperglycemia. They can also still cause hyperprolactinemia. Clozapine, as I said, is a second generation antipsychotic, but it is associated with agranulocytosis and neutropenia. So they need at least weekly blood tests initially, and this can be reduced to monthly if there's no concerns. So they need to be warned that they should present if they become and seek urgent medical attention if they become unwell in any way, as this could be a manifestation of agranulocytosis, even if this is as simple as a sore throat. And lastly, your third generation antipsychotics are aripiprazole. So these are partial agonists of dopamine. These are the least effective, but they are extremely useful in patients that have profound side effects, such as hyperprolactinemia, because they have the fewest side, of pro side effect profile. Okay, so that's an overview of antipsychotic options. So monitoring before you start, you need to make sure you assess cardiovascular risks, so family history of those risks, their own cardiovascular profile, so getting a baseline BP, um, bloods, and assessing their weight, diet control, and exercise. And they need to be followed up every six months with a physical health check of weight, blood pressure, but also uh, bloods and an ECG. So looking at their markers of any developing metabolic disturbance, any prolactin increases or any ECG disturbance as antipsychotics particularly um, can cause ECG disturbance, particularly QT prolongation, and that's something to be aware of. Um, so your anti-experimental side effects of antipsychotics I've talked about earlier. So the mainstay of treatment for these is to lower the possible dose or change to another antipsychotic if these are problematic. So the first of these to usually come on is dystonia. So these are painful neck, uh, painful uh, involuntary muscle contractions. So most commonly called tonus, so neck contractions or ocular giant crisis where your eyes roll up. And these are treated with antiponergics such as procyclidine. Then symptoms that come on a bit after are ach achophasia. So this is subjective sense of restlessness. And so, and and you can treat these sometimes with propanolol or a benzodiazepine, such as cyclohexidine. Parkinsonian symptoms can also occur. So these are your classical Parkinson signs, so resting tremor, rigidity, and bradykinesia. And these are managed with cyclidine. And lastly, tardive dyskinesia, which is the most serious side effect. And these are rhythmic involuntary, involuntary muscle contractions and movements of various muscle groups. So often you'll classically get patients getting a chewing or sucking movement with their mouth or making odd grimaces and movements with their arms. So 
main treatment for this is to stop the antipsychotic or reduce the dose, and you can try tetrabenazine, as I said before. Okay, metabolic side effects you wear off are things like weight gain, sedation, increased risk of diabetes, and increased cardiovascular risk. And this comes through your dyslipidemia, but also from arrhythmias because you get a increased um, you get a prolongation of your ECG. One thing to also mention is that um, Ozepine can also cause myocarditis and cardiomyopathy, which is a side effect that a lot of people forget about. Other side effects, uh, hyperplaxemia, um, symptoms as you would expect, and finally seizures. So antipsychotic can reduce the seizure threshold, but this is particularly for clozapine, and that's a common SBA question. Uh, neuroleptic malignant syndrome um, is a potential adverse event. So this can be a idiosyncratic, so patient-dependent reaction to a dopamine antagonist, or can be due to an overdose of a dopamine antagonist. Three main groups of symptoms, you get experimental symptoms of muscle stiffness, altered levels of consciousness, and also autonomic dysfunctions. So usually a fever, um, labile blood pressure, tachycardia, and urinary disturbance. They have a raised creatinine kinase and raised white cells, and this needs urgent treatment. So they need to stop the antipsychotics, often need to be transferred to ITU with cooling and um, treatment with gantrolene. Okay. So psychological managed psychosis, this usually takes place after the acute phase is over. And this is aimed at reducing the patient's impact of symptoms on the patient's life. So you need to treat the residual symptoms and you need to challenge the patient's beliefs. So you're trying to get them to challenge their own thoughts and realize the errors in their thinking. Okay. And uh, so this usually takes the form of CBT. It can also be useful to get the family involved through family therapy. Social management psychosis. So this is concerned with the practical needs of the patient. So um, allowing them to live their life. So addressing issues such as their housing and financial issues, and also giving them social skills training. So getting those interpersonal skills they need to go about life and get, get work, okay? Schizophrenia effective, so the management is basically the same schizophrenia, but you should also treat the depressive the symptoms if they are also an issue. So typically we have your SSRIs as is usually first line in um, depression, but you can also use electroconvulsive therapy as well in very severe cases. And if they have a if they have more effective um, uh, more effective symptoms that point to more bipolar and you can give mood stabilizers such as lithium. Okay. So delusional disorder, the management is mainly psychological. So using CBT to challenge their thought processes, just like in um, psychological therapy in psychosis with social skills trained like in psychosis. Um, and psychotics aren't usually used, but they can be used if needed. Okay, so moving on to the last section of the talk. I'm sorry, I know we're overrunning a little bit. Um, SBA8, the 22-year-old woman brought into the emergency department by her husband. He's concerned that for the last few weeks she left us on the floor. He, she's not concerned by this and states her son needs to learn to take care of himself. She states she now wants to get involved in new activities that now that she's not pregnant anymore and she's awake most of the night thinking of what activities to do. So what's the most likely diagnosis? I will give about 30 seconds to answer this. Maybe 10 more seconds. Okay, so we'll stop the poll there. 
So yes, most of you have put correct. So the answer is peripheral psychosis. So this woman is postpartum and she's got what appears to be some delusional thoughts and also some clearly manic symptoms with this whole idea of wanting to try new activities and not sleeping. So she has got ticking all the boxes for peripheral psychosis. Okay, and the last SBA, 24 year old woman visits her GP a few days after giving birth to her first child. She's more tearful than usual mentions that she's worried that she's not a good mother and is struggling to take care of her child. So how would we manage this patient? Again, 30 seconds for this. And just to answer the previous question, the answer is peripheral psychosis. Ten more seconds. Okay, let's stop the polling there. And most of you have got the answer right. So this is a example. This woman has baby blues. So she's not overly depressed. She's just a bit tearful. And this is very common especially in the first few days after giving birth to your first child. So supportive counselling is more than appropriate in this case. Okay, but I'll talk about that more in a bit. So perinatal psychiatry. So three main disorders to know about perinatal psychiatry. First is baby blues. As I said, it's transient and it's self-limiting. So usually three to five days after delivery. And this woman often has brief episodes of feeling very, um, of having fluctuating emotions, often quite tearful and irritable. Very common, 75% of new mothers. Postnatal depression can happen um, um, usually during the first postpartum year, but usually especially within the first three months. And this is major depression during this time. That happens with around 10% of new mothers. Peripheral psychosis is the rarest of these. This is by far the most serious. So this is where the woman has psychotic symptoms and affective symptoms postnatally, usually within the first two weeks and the symptoms will fluctuate quite rapidly. Okay, so we'll go through each of these. So big blues, risk factors. Um, most, most people think it's due to the hormonal change after giving birth. So you have a lot, a big withdrawal from the high levels of estrogens and progesterones that were produced by the placenta during pregnancy. And it takes a few weeks for the ovaries to kick in and start producing the hormones back to their pre-pregnancy levels. And this is the main mechanism that people think is responsible. So sleep deprivation does also seem to play a role. So it means presentation, as I said before, tearful, anxious and irritable, usually within the first three days, but can last up to two weeks. Postnatal depression, when you're thinking about the risk factors for this, again, think about biopsychosocial. So biologically, think about, so again, this idea of the hormone change is very, um, the idea of the hormone change is so the idea of the hormone change is very um, popular. That withdrawal of these high pregnancy hormones is responsible, as well as the elevated level of prolactin that happens while the woman's breastfeeding, if she's choosing to breastfeed, and this prob is probably polygenic as well. If the woman also had premenstrual symptoms before pregnancy, she's also likely to have postnatal depression. Thinking about psychological uh, factors, so if she's had any previous history of depression herself, whether in pregnancy or not, um, if she's not if she's not breastfeeding because of that lack of contact with the baby, that often can manifest as postpartum depression, and if the birth in particular is very traumatic, you also need to consider the person, the woman's pre-existing personality. Does she have a low self-esteem? And lastly, social women who are less supported or if it's their first pregnancy, are more likely to experience postnatal depression, especially if they're not aware of what, preg of what pregnancy or childcare entails. Okay, so they're the main groups of risk factors to be aware of. Move on. And postnatal depression presents exactly as you would expect, like a major depressive disorder. So, you, so they often have this lack of emotional bonding with the baby, and symptoms of major depressive disorder for at least two weeks. So the core symptoms of anhedonia, inertia, and low mood, 
and also your other symptoms that are associated with depression, such as um, disturbed sleep, um, low appetite, low libido, slowing down of their movements, poor concentration, feelings of guilt and worthlessness. But um, you'll learn more about the symptoms of depression in your depression talk next week. So peripheral psychosis, risk factors, basically the same as those for postpartum depression. So particularly if they had a very traumatic birth or very traumatic pregnancy, if it's the first pregnancy, and also if they've had a history or family history of peripheral, psych of peripheral psychosis or schizophrenia. Okay? There's also thought to be an association with viral dysfunction. Symptoms of peripheral psychosis, so they have these profound psychotic symptoms, but also affective symptoms usually manic in nature. So paranoia, hallucinations, altered mood, difficulty sleeping, disorientated and losing their inhibition. And if they're very depressed, they can also come under the category of peripheral psychosis because they develop delusional and psychotic ideas, such as their child is deformed, evil, or any uh, thoughts such as that. And this could lead them to think about considering killing their child or suicide on their own part. So it is a very serious condition. So how do we invest with a woman who's presenting pronatal psychiatric symptoms? So take a thorough history and invest uh, an examination, collateral history as you do with any psychiatric patient and use a valid screening tool such as the Edinburgh Postnatal Depression Scale. You then want to do your basic bloods Rule out any organic cause for depression or psychiatric symptoms. So your standard tests are inflammatory markers, blood blood count, electrolytes, and viral function. Okay. And then you can do other tests, so cortisol, anti-nuclear antibodies for any vasculitis or um, SLE, and a chest x-ray as well. If you want to rule out any sort, and whether this could actually be delirium. So baby blues, managing it very much down to supportive counselling because it is self-limiting. So you reassure so reassurance from my the, the doctor, the midwife, and getting sure that she has enough support both socially from family is usually enough. But if these symptoms are persisting, then she should be reviewed um, in case this is developing into depression or psychosis. Postnatal depression targets exactly like you would for any other um, psychiatric condition. So using a Biopsychosocial approach, biological management, as with normal depression, is your antidepressants. Um, all antidepressants are secreted in breast milk to some extent. Usually they're not detectable and they're usually all safe to use. The only one which is not usually used is fluoxetine because it does show significantly higher levels. Okay. And it's important to monitor the baby for possible side effects. Um, from breastfeeding whilst on antidepressants. If it's, um, so these should be considered if the, if the woman has moderate to severe depression. Um, so in cases where she's got a desire for medication, she doesn't want psychological treatment or her symptoms haven't responded to psychological treatments. And in very severe cases where she's strongly suicidal or not eating or drinking, then ECT can be used as the case in normal depression. Okay. Psychological management and social management of postnatal depression is usually more the mainstay. So making sure she's well supported from the partner and the family. And making sure that she does have um, rapid referral to psychological or psychological treatment. Usually she should be seen within two weeks of referral. So psychological management is more appropriate for women with mild, moderate or sub-threshold symptoms. And so they can be referred for self-help, usually facilitated. But if they have moderate or severe depression, then it's usually more appropriate to refer them for high intensity psychological therapies such as CBT, either with or without um, an antidepressant. Okay, and peripheral psychosis. So make sure that you exclude infection that could easily be delirium. So do an infection screen. Usually, in most cases, this requires emergency referral to a specialist team. 
especially um, because it is a very severe and it can have profound implications. And if this woman does need admission, it will be to a specialist mother baby unit. So that she can be under constant supervision, but she can also maintain the bonding between mother and baby, which is very important in those early days. So usually psychotherapy, like in psychosis, doesn't have a role in the acute phase, but may be used um, following the acute phase when she's recovering to help challenge her thoughts and help her cope with these. Mainstay is pharmacological management, and this is targeted to the symptoms. So um, if she's got profound psychotic symptoms and second generation and psychotics, mood stabilizers can be used. Um, obviously, this needs to take, um, but the medication needs to take into account whether she's breastfeeding. So things such as lithium, she should not be breastfeeding. Um, and psychotics are secreted in breast milk, but usually don't have any problems with those. But again, like with um, antidepressants, the baby should be monitored for any side effects. Clozapine is the main one that should not be given to breastfeeding women because, again, it can cause agranulized cytosis in the mother or potentially in the baby. Okay, and this is my final slide. Just something that is, I thought was quite useful, just to remind you about how referrals are made in psychiatry. So, when a GP assesses a patient, if they need to be seen by, by, secondary, by secondary care. This is made through single point of access. So single point of access is the referral pathway and they then decide what is most appropriate. Do they need to be seen by a specialist team or a standard community mental health team? And they are in turn also the, um, the gateways to inpatient admission. Um, if a patient needs psychological therapy, but they're still being managed in primary care. This is made through IAPT, so improving access to psychological therapies, so the GP can make this referral, or patients can actually refer themselves now as well. The alternative route to inpatient, manage, uh, inpatient admission is also mm -hmm. through liaison psychiatry or A&E, if they are deemed to be um, extremely high risk and they need to be taken to A&E. Okay. So that's the end of the talk.